Today's video is going to be the first in a series of fairly closely spaced videos that cover this big laser project I've been working on off and on for the past couple of years. And what I'm going to do today is I'm going to go over sort of lightly touch on the different systems and the layout of the laser. And then at the end of the video, what I'll do is some demonstrations of the power of the laser and the quality of the laser beam. And then in subsequent videos, what I'll do is I'll break it down and look at some of the subsystems, the power systems, the fluid handling systems, to get into a little bit more depth about how I did what I did and why I did that that way. To begin with, it's obviously a very large uh, laser. This is a flash lamp pumped rhodamine dye laser. And if you look at some of my other videos on uh, this channel, you'll see that I do cover dye lasers in some detail in these other videos. So they may be a little bit interesting if you're in interested in this kind of a laser. As you can see, it's big. It's 350 plus kilograms. And I'm grateful that when I began this project, I decided to build it on a separate, independent, wheel-mounted mobile cart uh, because of the fact that it's taken a long time and because it takes up a lot of room. It's very nice to have this on a mobile platform where I can get it out of the way when I'm doing some other project. And at the same time, I can also move it around in the room to better access different parts of it without having to climb behind it. Another really neat feature that I've learned to really appreciate is the use of this 8020 series uh, aluminum uh, structure material. It's made by a company called 8020 and they make these extruded aluminum components at all different size ranges as well as a whole family of attachment uh, brackets and fittings that allow you to do just about anything you can imagine. The simplest stuff that you see here is just a very limited amount of what they provide. But what's nice about that is it allows you, like an adult erector set, to build a structure that's very modular and very modifiable without having to tear apart a bunch of welding and a bunch of uh, permanently mounted structures. You'll see, for example, if you look carefully at the uh, platform here on the table. There's a small gap here between these two plates. Originally, when I began the project, this whole cart was only this long. And as time has proceeded and I decided that I wanted to build a larger laser, it was quite easy for me to simply purchase additional longitudinal stringer, stringers like this and like a limousine just sort of stretch the two ends apart without having to make any modifications of the ends. The stuff is also extremely stiff and when coupled with this uh, fiberglass platform up here, very, very rigid. I can lean on this thing while I'm modifying optics and you don't see any position shift, any, any um, distortion of the alignment. The other thing that I'll also comment on is this fiberglass material. It's an electrical grade fiberglass plate that I purchased from a US distributor called McMaster Car. It's 25 millimeters thick and it is extraordinarily well made. It's extremely flat. No matter how you put a straight edge on it, whichever side you look at, uh, it's dead nut square and perfectly flat and produces a very nice working surface. I haven't had to do any kind of machining to this at all except for drilling holes to mount it down. Um, it also allowed me, when I needed to enlarge the laser, to just duplicate the two pads and now I have twice the structure. The other thing you'll see up here is this uh, PVC box uh, that I built to enclose uh, the high voltage that goes up through this, um, this tabletop. And the reason for the plastic and the reason for the plastic is because I have as much as 20,000 volts coming from below up into the head that discharges in the flash lamp. And for safety reasons, you don't want conductive surfaces that you might brush against in the dark. And so the PVC and the fiberglass are all non-conductive. As, as an example, too, if you look at the hold-down bolts on these uh, optics, you'll notice they're all glass-reinforced fiberglass. They're not aluminum, so that anything that penetrates the surface is non-conductive. Back to the PVC box, however, it not only functions to protect uh, from electrical contact, but it also provides a, a light barrier. When the flash lamps discharge and it's extremely bright and you would flash a lot of light into the room through any kind of leakage from the pump chamber, this keeps it dark so you're not having to look at that. And it also provides a sealed, relatively airtight containment vessel so that what I do is below here on the lowest shelf, if you look down, you'll see a gray blower in the back. That blower draws air, room air, up through that uh, standard shop vac type of pre-filter 
and then pumps it through that back chamber where there's an OPA filter, which is a ultra high grade clean room style filter that then sends the pressurized air up through that tubing and into the head, providing a low flow of positive pressure and preventing dust and particles from getting on the flash lamp and the die cell and the uh, optics or the pump chamber inside, keeping them from getting uh, burnt by the dis deposition of the dust that can be burnt by the optics. Um, also, as you come around, you'll see what looks like kind of sloppy covering. This plastic uh, is another way of preventing dust from getting on the optics. Early on in this project, I had originally built a nice sexy uh, acrylic box to keep all of the optics clean and free of dust. But practically, as you're opening and closing and trying to access the optics, what you end up finding is that you're leaving it open a lot more than you would normally have to if you're just opening it up for the period that you're using it. So practically what I found is that the plastic wrap, when put on right after I'm using it and taken off just before I use it, has provided remarkable protection of the optics. As long as you don't touch the surfaces with the plastic and as long as you throw it away at single use, I've had some of the optics up here for as much as a year and a half and I've never had to clean them. There's never been any dust uh, deposition on them. If you come around over to this side of the laser and look over here, you'll see the low voltage control panel that essentially turns on the pump, the power supplies, the timing circuits, the, the thermal control system. This is what's used to control the laser and it keeps most of the low voltage or at most line voltage where you can see the fuses on the bottom from the very high voltage at the other end. You'll also see the big kill switch. This kill switch, if I hit it, just turns off everything. In addition, you'll see the, uh, the uh, CO2 container that holds the uh, fire extinguishing gas. I can put as much as 20,000 joules into this laser, and that's about six times the power of a typical shotgun shell. So when you've got that much energy going into the head and you've got some flammable gas uh, liquids in there, it could make a bomb. And so one of the, the protections that I have, in, in addition to the robust structure inside there that you'll see in a later vi video, is I have a heat detector in there that when uh, a flame or some sort of burn would occur in the head, it will automatically discharge the CO2, or if I hit the kill switch, I'll discharge the CO2 into the system and hopefully inhibit any kind of a fire. As you continue to come around, you'll see on the back side here a couple of features. One is the oxygen tank in the back. Uh, turns out that the xanthine dyes, the rhodamine dyes, uh, work better if they have triplet quenching. One way to do that is the cyclooctatetrine that a lot of people do. And sometimes people will just depend on the oxygen from the atmosphere uh, to uh, quench the triplet state. Saturating with pure oxygen is even better. But what I've discovered is saturating with oxygen and CO2 and COT is better yet. And so I run a low flow, a bubble flow, of oxygen over the dye in the circulating reservoir that saturates the dye within about five or six minutes with pure oxygen. And then because of any of the uh, gas that then leaks out from that pressurized reservoir, I have a small tube that goes through a, CO2, uh, through a carbon filter, preventing any kind of a solvent or any of the smells of the dye laser from getting into the room. The other thing that you'll see down here is the vacuum pump. This system is actually triggered by what would seem to be kind of a prosaic method of triggering a flash lamp. First saw it described about uh, 40 years ago in the Scientific American Amateur Scientist about building your own homemade dye laser. And what it really does is it's a periodic evacuation of the flash lamp until they reach the point that they discharge. And for any of you out there that are sneering at that method, Understand that I have triggered this laser with a thyrotron, with spark gaps, with external wire triggering, injection triggering, simmer, prepulse, done it. Been there, got the t-shirt, did it all. But what I found is that this system produces the brightest, shortest pulses, very high repeatability between the pulses, jitters on the order of a few milliseconds because of the very automated system. And for a number of other reasons, including expense and safety and maintenance, it's turned out to be the best method. Finally, one of the things, and we'll get into that in more detail when we talk about the flash lamps in another video. Finally, you'll see the two reservoirs down there. These reservoirs contain waste and fresh dye. And even though there is a reservoir on the other end of the laser, 
you see a similar one in one of my other videos where the dye is actually being actively pumped and circulated through the head. One of the problems with very high energy dye lasers is that the amount of light that hits the dye it destroys the dye. It, it produces a lot of dye degradation. And so what you end up having is the very first pulses out of a fresh dye load are the most powerful. Anybody that works with uh, dye lasers knows that. Fresh dye, good power, as time goes on it starts to deteriorate. Some manufacturers, some experimenters deal with that by producing extremely large reservoirs to try to dilute it. Other researchers, what they do, like for example, Sinusure laser, they will take a small amount of that reservoir dye, filter it, put back in the necessary dye and additives to sort of polish the dye in the reservoir, but there's always an equilibrium involved. In other words, you're always dumping some of the degradation products into the reservoir, whether you dilute them or you're trying to replenish them or refresh them. The best method was patented by one of the founders of Candela laser many years ago and effectively operates such that it takes all of the dye laser, lasing dye that's exposed to a flash lamp pulse and throws it away. And so none of the degraded dye ever gets back into the reservoir. And so that dye is periodically thrown out of the system each time it pulses and you have a reservoir of additional dye that maintains the fluid level in the dye chamber with a float switch. It works remarkably well. And so the first pulse is no more powerful than the thousandth pulse. And that's about as many pulses as I get out of one of these containers. And if you look over there on that table, you'll see that little filter. I just take that finished dye when I've run, th run out of my, uh, my fresh dye. I'll take one of the containers, I'll just put them down here, throw in the tubes, half an hour later, dye is crystal clear, it's ready for fresh dye and fresh additives and back into the system again. So I, reserve, I prevent uh, dye waste, it, uh, it's greener, and uh, as a result, I also save a lot of money. That has turned out to be a very effective system. So anyway, that's kind of what's going on here. That's the layout. And the reason I didn't want to bog down in each of the details is because this would just be an enormous video and we'd lose track of what we we're trying to get across. So I'll cover these other issues, each one of the different uh, parts of this, in later videos, but I'll try to do them pretty, pretty soon after I publish this one. And so at this point, what I'm going to do is I'm going to break from the video for a couple of minutes. I'm going to take the plastic off the optics. I'm going to warm up the laser and we'll finish up the video with some demonstrations of it in operation, show you kind of what power and beam quality it can produce. See you in a second. I had a chance to take off the plastic and warm the laser up for a few minutes, get the oxygen running through it, and so it's ready to fire. And as what you can see in front of my face is a ceramic target uh, that I've got positioned about three meters from the laser. And I've got the laser dialed up to about 25% of maximum power. Uh, it turns out that's about as high as I can go with the conventional optics. Uh, I've ordered some very special optics that have higher damage thresholds, but I don't know if you're able to see this. I'll hold it relatively close. But this lens here is an example of what happens when you run the laser up around 30, 35%. Uh, blew it up in one pulse. So dropping it down just a little below the safety threshold, I'm going to be operating this laser at about 10,000 volts, which is about 25% maximum power. I still think it would be pretty impressive with the power. So keep an eye on the ceramic plate. Okay. I'm going to be ready to turn it on. Are you ready for the camera? Okay. Here we go. In a few seconds, make sure my Okay, the laser is charging. And it's going to be firing in a few seconds here. I've got it on a fairly low button. If you saw the camera shake, that was my cameraman being shocked a little bit by the power levels. It'll fire again in about 15 seconds so you'll get a good view of uh, the plasma. You may not see the laser pulse as well because the laser goggles are designed to block that. But what you're seeing is a terrified cameraman. Okay, now what I've done is I've set up a system where I have the ceramic plate over here. And I've taken the output of the laser and sent it all the way across the room to a meter about five meters away. 
distance, so the net distance is 10 meters to this area here. The optical system here expands the beam a little bit, so it starts out at 10 millimeters coming off the table. And what it ends up here will give you an idea of what the divergence of the beam is. So I'm going to go around, I'm going to turn on the laser and fire it again, and you can see what it does to this target. Okay, I'm going to be charging the laser now. Take a few seconds. Here we go. Now, if you look at that spot there, that's about, I don't know, 16 millimeters in diameter, the actual divergence of the laser is therefore about 6 millimeters over 10 meters. And so, as a consequence, have a divergence that's really good for a flashlight pump die laser, and especially at that power level. And that has to do with some of the unusual optics that I have on that table. And I'll give you an example of what's going on there when I break to another video a little bit later in this series. So one more pulse so I can discharge the laser. The laser is now been disabled, so it's not going to fire again. And I uh, want to thank you for watching, and I uh, look forward to seeing you in a little bit.